Hi, uh, my name is Volker Bertelmann, a.k.a. Hauschka, and uh, I'm a pianist and composer from Düsseldorf, Germany. And uh, I'm mainly, maybe mostly known for prepared piano, but um, I've, I do many other things uh, in terms of music. I mean, I composed already music when I was 10, as a little kid. Um, I was always interested in, you know, creating my own kind of world musically. In 2001, I uh, somehow discovered in Wales, uh, in, the, in the mountains, in the Bracken Beacons, I discovered that I want to make a prepared piano record. And from there on, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I've done 12 records with prepared piano and I'm working on compositions for strings, for orchestra, for films. So there's a wide range of what I'm doing. Well, when I was uh, in the age of nine, um, I was uh, I was raised in a very strong Christian community. So, in the community, there was a piano player playing Chopin on one Sunday, and I was sitting with my mom in that concert, and I said to my mom, "I want to have lessons. Can we ask him if he is te if he can teach me?" and uh, she said, but we don't have a piano. And so I, I, we had to find someone who was sponsoring us a piano because we had not so much money. But then my grand aunt was uh, giving us a piano as a gift. And um, I, I think in a half a year I had lessons with this man and uh, he was teaching me for at least six years piano. And in a way, all the way through, um, with 12, I had my first band where we did it like Rolling Stones covers and, you know, all sorts of band covers. Uh, that was um, maybe at the end of the 70s. From there on, in a way, music was always a part of my life. I, well, in general, I, I mean, I started with a classical piano, which means like Beethoven, Chopin, uh, Mozart, all the, you know, all the classical uh, piano pieces that, you know, uh, I, I was playing. But even in the age of 12, I had already my first MOOC synthesizer. And uh, I remember I was always using that when I was, when I was sick. I had a big Leslie, uh, like a rot rotating speaker in my bedroom. <laughs> and uh, I was playing the MOOC synthesizer with a record that was called Jeff Wayne, War of the Worlds. And I was just putting that on my vinyl player. And then I played along with that, like, like the bass lines and I was totally fascinated by creating sound with with an instrument and finding own own sounds myself so in the age of 12 uh, because I had this synthesizer maybe guys asked me to be a part of the band and then uh, we, we had already a band at that time and we we rented a rehearsal room in that age already and we you know it was a very small village uh, an hour away from um, Düsseldorf and the only place where you could spend spare time was uh, actually in that rehearsal space because there was no club no you know all the girls came into the rehearsal space because that was the place where people made music so in a way for us as uh, the band uh, it was of, of course wonderful we had everything there that we wanted at that time music and girls that was uh, you know with 14 maybe everything you wish for and uh then, um, you know, at some point, I, my first record deal with Sony Music I had um, in the age of 24. And that was actually also a funny thing because my cousin and me, we decided one day, he was uh, born in Richmond, Virginia, and we met by accident in Düsseldorf on the streets. Um, I came out of a pub and suddenly this guy was standing in front of the pub and he was exactly looking like my cousin. So I went to him and I said, I think you are my cousin. And he said, yes, I am. You know, so, which was very interesting because that changed, this moment changed my life for about 10 years because on that evening we decided to be a band and release our first record and uh, we financed the record ourselves. And we made a diary about every day how we are making our way towards a, a record deal without having no idea how we get there. But I have, and I think until now, I have the feeling that wishes, in a way, they have to establish before they become true. So you have to actually, even though you think it's unrealistic, you have to 
think of them and you have to actually work towards them. And then suddenly we had one concert at a, at a music fair in Cologne and we, sat, we got the record deal with Sony Music. Just for one, we did just one gig. And a, a few weeks later I was on tour with the biggest German hip hop band um, as a supporting act. That was a wonderful experience. It was nearly like a, you know, like a mad ride for, I would say, two years, three years. And uh, the record company was not picking up the record. And at that time, it was for me already clear that I'm not only for the commercial purpose. I had the feeling that I get the most creative when I have no occupations, when I don't have to fulfill whatever to be the singer or you know to be the front man or um, I always felt like music is for me much more like a creation that has no no limit in space sometimes it can be just 40 seconds of a beautiful sound but sometimes it can be a track of eight minutes with a beat so in a way at that time I uh, I made the decision that I will only want to make music without form and without a singer Hauschka was always a name for me to have to be in a way a band that has no gender in a way where you don't know what it is uh, because I felt like it's nice to be you know to have some unexpected experience I wanted to make without any laptop on stage and then I went I found out that preparations are my option to do that and um, but the journey to there was through pop music, uh, writing songs, working with singers, producing records. So I went through all these little steps of um, creation. And now when I'm doing film music, I can actually you know, work on all of it. I mean, when they want a song, I can write a song. When there is uh, you know, string arrangements, I can write string arrangements. Um, when I need piano, I can play piano. So in a way, the film music is in a way asking for everything. And that's why, why I like the, uh, you know, the approach of film music very much. I remember I was recording in Wales in the Bracken Beacons uh, record with a band called Music AM. Um, and uh, we, we also only made music in the mornings. That's why it's called Music AM. And we wrote that, uh, you know, from six to nine. And the mood of music in that time is totally different than writing at night. So in a way, we also stood up very early and sometimes I was up so early that nobody was awake because I was in the rhythm of my little kids. So I was sitting at a piano and I played regularly there. And uh, while I was playing, I was thinking, I, why haven't I done a piano record? And uh, I was always like, because I was scared. Uh, I was scared to release a piano record with my, I was not a virtuous piano player. I had in a way a trust in the ideas whenever I was surrounded by others. But whenever I was playing my, like a piece by myself, I was insecure. I didn't know if that would work as a, you know, being in the shelf next to all the virtuous players that were out there at that time, like Keith Jarrett or Horowitz or like the, you know, from jazz to classic, you had like the most amazing players. And so I felt like if I'm going in there with my little small piano pieces, maybe, uh, you know, I will, I will do one record and then I'm, I'm done. And I think maybe if I find out now that maybe everyone has these kind of insecurities, but you know, you have to find out or you get thrown into, into it like this and people tell you, do it, you know? Um, so, in a way, when I got, um, when I was sitting there and I played the pieces, I always felt like I need actually something that is on top of the piano that I can actually do by myself. And one thought was that I want to create piano music with sounds on top of it. So um, on my first record and also on the new record that I released right now, you can find piano pieces that are covered with restaurant noises so you can hear I'm actually going into a library where I can find or I'm recording restaurant noise where people are talking and I blend them into the piano music that it sounds like I'm sitting in the in the restaurant playing piano and suddenly the piano music becomes a different perspective the piece is suddenly a little bit like a, a part of a radio play and I love that so that was one idea the other idea was how can I create 
sounds on top of the strings without losing the piano sound. And uh, so there were some Christmas cake uh, bags out of cellophane uh, lying around and I was taking one and I hold it between the hammers and the strings and I played the, the note and suddenly I heard this tick, tick, tick on top of the string. I said, oh, that's a perfect hi-hat, but I have to hold it all the time. So that's, I have no hand free anymore. So the next thing was I got some tape and I was taping it so that it was hanging between the strings. And then I tried out with my fingers to mute the strings and uh, slowly by discovering the options, I was suddenly aware that this is the way that I might want to go. But on the first record, I released only a few um, songs with little preparations. And the second record is called The Prepared Piano, where I played the whole record with preparations. But at the same time, I also wrote a long text about all the inventors, because I'm not the inventor. There's a long history of, um, of prepared piano, but I was not aware of that. I didn't know about John Cage at that time. I didn't know... The teacher of John Cage was Henry Cowell, who did a lot of, he did, does some, did some wonderful composition work where he's just scrapping the strings and uh, it's really beautiful. So in a way, by learning all these kind of guys that were doing this, suddenly this whole universe of composers and music uh, was opened for me. And uh, um, from there on, I was discovering all sorts of objects. I was, in a way, running around like mad to search things that I, uh, you know, that I could put in there. And of course, I discovered new things that are now in my, uh, like, for example, the saxophone reeds. Uh, they were lying in the backstage area, so I was taping them together and stuck them in. And some of those preparations stayed with me forever, and others were, you know, in and out in a way and others were gone so in a way it's a, a constant selection process in a way the randomness sometimes triggers my intention to work in a certain direction and sometimes the intention actually starts to help the randomness to you know to take place and I think in the idealist case these elements are constantly switching between intention and then you have space for randomness and you break free in a way with what you have and then you actually calm yourself down and you say, whoa, not too much or, you know, breathe. Let's say the, the ping pong balls are a very good example uh, because they, in a way, when they lie on a string, I can't tape them. I had the ideas of putting a rope on every ping pong ball and so that when they jump, I can actually keep them somewhere in an area of where they are because otherwise they just, you know, they go everywhere. But at the same time, when they are in the center and they all walk, they all jump over here at some point. Um, and, you know, when I'm playing, suddenly I realize, oh, there's no ping pong balls. But the ping pong balls are a, um, definitely a sound of what I'm playing. I have to go in the register up here and I have to play the the keys in a way that they jump over there. They only jump when you press the keys pretty hard. So in a way, suddenly you get very loud in that register to make the ping pong balls go that way. And suddenly you are not a, you're not forced by tonality, you're forced by events. It's very liberating because you're not thinking anymore in melodies or in, uh, you know, in tonal chords or where you feel like this is a pop song. You suddenly uh, think in what you see. You see like a ball jumping over that side and you're like, oh no, I have to do this. And I wanted to keep that in my music uh, because when you do that, suddenly the music becomes a very, a very storytelling element. Well, I mean, by finding the way of creating different sounds in a, in a piano, um, you have of course the ability of playing all the sounds at the same time. And that means like sounds are interacting, resonances are interacting. You have the sustain pedal that creates a reverb. Um, you know, I'm using whatever. If I want to have a very constant note, I'm using, for example, this, uh, you know, like these, these cymbals or the tambourine just to get a kind of steady rattling on top of the strings. And um, what happens then is that you suddenly think 
when you close your eyes and you get detached from seeing me, you suddenly think, what is this? What is this sound? Where is that instrument coming from? And at some point you are getting used to it so much that you really, you know, get it attracted. Well, I mean, I started, uh, I'm not sure how many scores I've done now uh, since, uh, you know, I did my first film. Um, but it's definitely quite uh, w way over 10 um, that I've done. And uh, I think um, the main, well, the, the main door opener at some point was, of course, the film Lion that I did with, uh, with Dustin O'Halloran, a very good friend of mine, where coincidentally it happened that the director was asking the two of us if we could work together on a movie. Um, and interestingly enough, at that time, we had, uh, you know, friends of ours that were working on, were starting to work in films even earlier. Um, I mean, Dustin was already working long, longer than me in, uh, on movies. Uh, and uh, Lion was in a way for me the first film where I felt, um, you know, very strongly about continuing making film music and, um, in Lion, I was, you know, the director asked me, especially for the first half that is taking place in India with a little boy, because he felt like maybe my music is pretty, not wild, but there is some, you know, claustrophobic element in there and there's some darkness as well. And, you know, that the boy got lost in the train is pretty, uh, you know, I mean, you can start crying straight away when you see this boy. And you know that he is alone in train driving 1800 kilometers locked up in a train. It's like the most horrible picture you can imagine. Um, and so in that whole first half, um, there's a lot of prepared piano, but at the same time, Dustin and me, we found out that we're not meant to be only for one part, that we want to mix up everything. But specifically in the first um, cues where the boy gets lost, there are a couple of cues that are specifically made with prepared piano. And um, in a way, what was interesting with that was that I was playing and we both were playing the whole score to picture. So we were handcrafting every cue. And uh, the difficulty with that is that when you handcraft a cue and you get notes, you have to go back and record the whole thing again. Because when somebody, when the director says, I, I don't like the pace here in that area, you have to go back and you have to practice. And then you say, oh, maybe that's the right tempo. And then, re then you record. With MIDI, it's much easier because you just, you know, you press the button with tempo and you just take the tempo down, you know. At the same time, I found out that uh, the you know the push and the pull in uh, in those scores is very it's very helpful that you have your own tempo and that the click is not directing you, but that you actually start to breathe and go in and out of the scene in a way. And by that, you attach much more to the picture. From there on, I um, you know I more and more was doing that that I took the click away and you know what is interesting about all these different film projects is that there's always a way of always the communication is differently and you, you know as we all know when we're we having one word let's say uh, um, claustrophobic that means for some person uh, like soundless and for another person it means like the the biggest bass ever um, so to find a level in between those words for a common ground is for me one of the most wonderful way of communicating. Um, well, the first time I came across Spitfire was, of course, because I was a user of a Spitfire library. And what I found, what I found fascinating uh, at that time, I remember that it was so textural. I had the feeling that there is a different focus on on the sound. It's not only the one-to-one -one process like process of creating strings like they sound in their most beautiful way there was a lot of effort in finding ways of using a microscope and zooming into the nearly to the strings in a way 
that is what I really loved about it. And I think from there on, I was uh, using more and more uh, libraries in a way. And at some point I heard when, I think it was even here in the Voxtone studios, because I think he was recorded a library at one point uh, before and that somebody told me, hey, um, you know, we work on a library. And so I, I suddenly said to myself, maybe it's, there's a time where I have the feeling that it's maybe nice to have a, to do actually a prepared piano library. Also out of the um, reason that I had the feeling, you know, that there are two things that are important for me. One is that sometimes I'm on the road and I'm working on from a laptop and I have no pre prepared piano library that sounds really good. So it was always like, I, it would be nice to have actually my own library. So in a way I was even thinking of creating an own library at some point. Um, and the second thing was that I had the feeling that it's nice to not protect, you know, your discoveries. I think it's something that I'm already doing in my concerts. In the beginning, I was a little bit careful because I felt maybe when I'm opening the sounds to everyone that suddenly my, you know, my own music gets a little bit blurry by all sorts of people that are working with those sounds. But at the same time, I have the feeling that it's actually a very good thing that I can release the ideas in a way in the world and I can actually, you know, work on it in a different way. And I was also finding out that it doesn't mean that um, most likely how I'm working with the, uh, with the preparations is a very unique thing. So I don't feel like, you know, to a certain extent, maybe um, you will hear maybe sometimes a song and you think it's me, but uh, at the same time, I'm not scared of that because I have the feeling it's, uh, it's something that helps me. And so um, these two reasons were in a way the reason why then at some point my agent, she, I think she met one of the Spitfire guys and uh, at a soundtrack festival and they were talking. And uh, I think from that conversation, the idea was suddenly just falling towards me and uh, here I am. Well, first of all, I think the process of creating a library has different levels for my uh, uh, understanding. One is that you have to have, of course, wonderful sounds and you have to map them right and you have, they have to sound great and the, the sound in general has to be good. So we made a, I made a selection of sounds where I felt that they are, that they work in a way and they are essential also for, I was thinking, what would I use when I would be somebody that needs, for example, for a certain purpose, a drum or a dark drone or some music that is very textile and you don't know how to get the, the texture in it. So in a way I was concentrating mostly on percussive, you know, more textures, like specific qualities of sounds. And uh, we were recording that. But then there's also one thing when I'm using, for example, sample libraries, I'm always fascinated when they bring me to a point where I can actually solve my problem very quickly and uh, at the same time where they help me in an easy way to, you know, create something new and I'm like, oh, I can do this and this and then suddenly that brings you to another point. And I think that's also important that you think about how you conceptualize the randomness of prepared piano and it's not only a one-to-one -one thing. I, I love actually the exchange and I love actually to learn from you know creating something and maybe um, it's not doing the job as, as it does but I mistakes or failures are for me not something uh, that are problematic it's more about learning from them but of course I'm not I'm not thinking that it's a failure it's more like something where I have the feeling that it's an exchange I give something to people to work with and hopefully they give me feedback uh, about how they work with it. But in general, I would love that they are, you know, using it whenever they have the feeling, you know, I'm stuck. I don't know. I would love to do this kind of whatever steady rhythm, but I don't want to use a drum kit and I don't want to use a, 
um, a vibraphone. Or I don't want to use the obvious instruments that you use for like a ticking clock. What can I use? Oh, I would love to, maybe this in, in Falker's library, there's a sound and you open it up and you find the sound. That would be, for example, ideal. And um, at the same time, uh, it's, you know, I think toolkits in a way are also representing the way how you work. So I think everybody who gets a little bit of knowledge about the music that I'm doing or, you know, the scores that I'm doing, he will most likely find sounds of that library in there. Um, and uh, of course, when you have them all like separated, you have them all in the right key, you maybe have things in tempo or in sync, then that would be obviously enormously helpful um, while you're working. Well, you know, when, when I was thinking about the library, uh, I mean, Voxtone, as I said before, was already, uh, I think they were, you know, they were doing some other recordings here already for, for Spitfire. So when I had the feeling that all these elements are coming together, I went straight away to Francesco and asked him if he would record me also because he recorded my last record. He's a very good sound engineer and he knows exactly how to go precise, you know, inside of the piano, um, how to mix it. And, you know, maybe you're self-conscious. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, it's, it, in general, I think it's important uh, to find a space where you feel confident. And uh, Voxstone is a place that I feel very confident with. And uh, Francesco is a sound guy that I feel confident with. And at the same time, he's also working with modular synth. And I had the feeling that it might be a nice idea of incorporating him, um, helping with some additional sounds uh, besides the um, fact that I'm, ha I'm having effects that I'm using. And he has a wonderful, like, old uh, reverb plate um, that is, you know, that I think we recorded as well. And uh, the, there's a Binson delay that we used a lot of times, which is a beautiful sounding old, like, not, well, there's an echo in it, but it's very gentle. And uh, so when I was looking at that, I felt like this is the right place. Well, it's, uh, I'm running things through, uh, it's not a pedal board that I built, it's more like a, like a guitar setup, but I'm putting that on the side of the piano. In a way, it's all guitar pedals, but it's mainly reverbs, delays, and I'm looping, I'm using a loop station. For the sample library was, I think we used it once, uh, but in general, I think it's better that you create your loops yourself the library so a loop station doesn't is in a way a restriction for a sample library you know I, I was actually thinking that I want to use all the distortions and reverbs as a tail because with a prepared piano there are a few things that are very hard to achieve one is sustained notes I mean when you play a note it disappears at some point but a, a pad sounds constantly so um, in a way to create that with a piano only is only doable with an ebo or it's doable with something like rattling like in like a vibrator for example um, I'm, I'm using for example this little vibrator that i found you know in a men's restroom in an airport and the good thing about that is that it fits exactly on one string and one note and when you tape that on a on a string it actually creates like a very nice kind of sitar note but a steady note and by using that, I think uh, it, it came from the problem that I couldn't hold a note all the time. So um, in a way, I needed help with that, you know. I had conversations beforehand with people that are working with libraries. And uh, I, you know, I always felt that was a little bit more divided in a way uh, where I had the feeling that uh, I, I always had the feeling that Spitfire is a band or something like that, that they are people that in a way think or actually maybe all have a very musical background and maybe they have all their own projects in a way but at the same time it appeared that they're coming together and think about the things in a way that I would achieve them as well like so how can we how, what feels good um, what feels natural um, what is the artist like um, you know I never felt forced into a corner. It was much more like 
always an exchange of thoughts and of course I bring things on the table and uh, you know I don't know how to manufacture that into a library so of course there's a, um, a different dif different responsibility but at the same time it was always like uh, hey why don't we try that or why don't we do that so the nice thing about it is that you don't feel alone um, by delivering the content and uh, And then it's somehow packaged and at some point you just get a, an email, we finished your plugin, you know. <laughs> That's not the case. It's more like you, you know, you get maybe a, an idea and then you send it back and you make notes. So um, the experience is definitely collaborative. What I like about it is that actually that you can find very dense elements of sounds that you're in a way familiar with. But there's always a slightly off element in there where I feel like, no, it's not that. It's not a sitar, but it sounds like a sitar. Or it's not a, it's a rhythm and it sounds like a drum kit, but it's not. So what is it? And I think this bizarre um, element makes it very, it's very helpful to, you know, to feel the music in a different way. And um, I would say the library maybe gives that feeling as well, that it has different levels of instrumentations. <laughs> 